Good evening, and welcome to UCSD Conversations. I'm Mary Walshock, Associate Vice Chancellor for Public Programs at the University of California, San Diego. It is my pleasure to introduce you to some of our faculty and their cutting edge research. Please join us for an enlightening evening of conversation. Tonight, a novelty orchestra provides sound for silent films. And you will meet one of America's new astronaut candidates, UC graduate Megan MacArthur. But first, Muir College Provost Patrick Ledden, in conversation with Susan Shirk, a noted China expert who has just completed three years at the State Department in Washington, D.C. Pat? Thank you, Mary. My guest today is Professor Susan Shirk of the Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. She is also the research director of the UC-wide Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation and has most recently been the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, from 1997 to 2000. Glad to welcome Susan back, uh, back to UCSD Conversations and back to UCSD. Thank you for being here. Well, my pleasure. Being uh, in the State Department must have been a very exciting experience. It was. Uh, you had studied China all your life, but now you get to think about China in ways that are, are part of our whole diplomatic mission. Yes, and to be a participant. To be a participant. What, what does being a participant mean? What kinds of things did you do? Well, my responsibility was to manage U.S.-China relations. I also was responsible for Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. That's a Ta modest portfolio. Well, Mongolia didn't get too much attention because the China-Taiwan-Hong Kong, Hong Kong issues course, really claimed of most of my yeah, time. Of so uh, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the East Asia Bureau, which is the regional bureau. So basically responsible for all aspects of our relations with China, ranging from trade to human rights to nonproliferation, scientific and environmental cooperation, you name it. Diplomatic relationship? I mean, so yes. Yes, right, right. So, so what, what your, your work, you worked with the Assistant Secretary and the Deputies and the, and the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. You provided them information. They provided material for you to carry out. I mean, how did the how did the work flow, so to speak? Well, uh, you know, I advised them on recommended approaches. Uh -huh. I supported them by getting memos and papers and talking points for meetings sure. done by the China and Taiwan desk that I supervised. This is, this is the permanent staff of people who specialize in. Yeah, in most the of the people working in the State Department are professional Foreign Service sure. officers. Of there are also some civil servants. Oh, I see. Okay. But they, they, they're independent of the administration. That's right. The political appointees come in uh, every four years. And get educated by... Right. And, you know, uh, I was warned about that. One of my colleagues who'd been a political appointee in another department said that she felt she was always treated like summer help. <laughs> you know, they just sure, worked course, around course, her right. knowing she wasn't going to be there sure. too long. I did not have an experience oh, like that at all. Yes. I, uh, first of all, they couldn't because I had line responsibility right. and right. I had to uh, uh, be involved in sure. everything. But uh, they're really terrific people and I had no problems at all. But also you knew a lot about China. Well, that's true. And I mean, you've I think had your whole career thinking about China. That's so, right. right. And, so and they people, recognized that pretty quickly, I assume. I guess so, but they were very nice and, right. and we worked right. together very so, well. So you had to do, I mean, you had, I think in your watch, there was the president of China came to the U.S. That must have been a tremendous amount of work. Well, all these state visits are sure. a tremendous amount of work, sure. but incredibly useful because well, they're what course. you call action forcing events. So it inspires the two sides to get flexible and really come to conclusion and decide some things and it's what we call the deliverables for so this a meeting. Is, this is so that the two can get together and announce results. The, that's the, the, right. pres the two presidents or, or whatever. Right. Yeah. That's right. And right. there are a number of issues that you haven't quite come to closure around that are so difficult. To speak. Right. Yes. Right. right. So yes. the visits help yes. crystallize yes. these. And that precipitates both sides moving towards closure of some kind. That's right. Right. Was was that, that the work that you did then was sort of working with the Chinese, the Chinese side? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be exciting. 
Well, it's, it was very challenging yeah. and uh, Lots very interesting. Lots of long days? Lots of long days? And nights. And nights, of course. A huge amount of information. Is, 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 is there sort of almost information overflow at some point? Well, it depends what you kind of information you're yeah. talking I about. Know. I don't know. I always feel like we don't have enough information oh, about China. Well, of course. I mean, there's so many things sure. that we don't really understand mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. we wish we understood mm -hmm. better. But when you're trying to make a policy, when you're trying to come to closure on a particular issue, a trade issue or something? It's not really an information. It is not an information. No, it's the uh, how to induce China to take steps to change its own practices mm -hmm. in many different areas. Mm -hmm. yes. Example, in ways that yeah. we think will be good for their own people, but also bring them in line with international standards. Well, no, uh, non-proliferation. Right. How to stop selling uh, technologies related to nuclear weapons or missiles to other countries. Sure. In the old days, China was really a major part of the problem, a major proliferator. Sure. And, you know, what interest do they really have in cleaning up their act? you have to figure out a way to persuade them that it's in their own interest to do so. Sure. And this has actually been pretty successful mm -hmm. over the past mm -hmm. uh, decade or mm -hmm. so. And you see China signing one international agreement yeah. after the yes. another, the non-proliferation yes. treaty, mm -hmm. comprehensive test ban treaty, right. and uh, putting in place its own export controls. And mm -hmm. most of the motivation for that is that they really want to be recognized now mm -hmm. as a world power, sure. and happily, they want to be recognized as a responsible world power. Mm -hmm. Not so, a rogue power, so to speak. That's right, right. not a yeah. rogue. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. their own self-image mm -hmm. and uh, sense of their own reputation motivates them to do a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Then we also um, you know, remind them that so long as they are known as proliferators, it's going to be very difficult for us to license sales of high-tech technologies of to China. Right. And they'd like to buy these things. Sure. So, uh, like supercomputers sure. or whatever. Sure. So, sure. that also is another incentive for them. But that's the, that's the negotiating. That's, that's yeah. when you sit down with them and say, these are the things that you would gain by right. doing right. what we would like. Right. we would recommend you do and they they presume bring things the same the other direction they're things they want well, supercomputers or access to trade what they or mostly want is us to change our policy toward taiwan ah which we're not tough willing problem. to do tough problem sure. we're not willing to do and sure. uh, i think you're going to see that becoming an even more pointed pressure in the next few months but they are very concerned for example we're trying to get them to stop selling uh, weapons of mass destruction and missile technology to other countries. Right. They're trying to get us to stop selling weapons to Taiwan, Taiwan to defend themselves. But we have an obligation to sure. do that, and yes. we intend to continue Keep to do that. Yes. And certainly so long as China is modernizing its military and deploying more missiles opposite Along Taiwan, we feel it's sure. only mm -hmm. Uh, appropriate that we continue to help Taiwan defend itself, but from their perspective, we're interfering sure. in with an uh, internal matter. All that's right. right. Yes, yes, yes. Wasn't there just about when you started in the State Department some saber rattling, pretty serious saber rattling? You know, well, in back the, in '96 in, 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 in the in the Formosa Straits, yeah. That's right. Before I uh, came in, there were these massive military exercises and missile tests, and China had done that to signal its unhappiness when we allowed the Taiwan president to come to the United States right. and make right. political oh, speech. And of course, right, right, and that was their response. And then we sent, didn't we send? We sent two carriers right. to the region. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it was a tense moment, and mostly. Uh, what was always in our minds as we were working the past three years was to prevent that from happening yes. again you never or want something to be worse. There. You never want to be there. I mean, you prefer never to be in that sort of circumstance. Right. We have guns facing guns, absolutely. Was the, on your watch, I think, the bombing in Belgrade? Yes, was that, that was is definitely that a, a low right? point. That had to be a tough time. 
Yes, yes. How, how, so your job was partly to flash in response? Yes. For um, our government to their government? That must have been a tough time. It was very tough because, you know, it's already, it's already difficult enough yeah. to try to develop a cooperative and constructive relationship right. with a China that is becoming more powerful economically and militarily. And to, uh, you know, to have this uh, bolt out of the blue yeah. added to our problems. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was really a low point. We, when I heard about it, of course, I was on my way home and uh, got a call in the car, went right back to the department and stayed there for quite a number of days. Um, because as you recall, the Chinese reaction was really uh, strong. They, the Chinese yes, people, right. Absolutely. Uh, especially students, Yes, went I to yeah. our embassy and consulates yeah. and trashed them. Yes. And the government, uh, in all of its statements, implied, not just implied, they came out and stated it was intentional. Of course, right. And uh, so, in effect, they facilitated sure. this trashing of sure. our embassy. So yeah. I was on the phone for days, an open line we had. And we did, uh, had open lines to all of our consulate and embassies, and I was the person in Washington talking to these people. It was very frightening of course. Of course. for them. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, we were very firm and at going to them. In fact, Secretary Albright went to the Chinese embassy that Saturday mm. night, yes. and she had two messages. One was a very sincere apology for what was a terrible accident. And secondly, you better send your police to protect our... American property. Absolutely. Yes. And people. Yes, of course, of course. So uh, it was a very tense time, and we did everything we could to make amends to the president, sign the condolence book. He, of course, apologized to Jiang Zemin. Sure. We, uh, because it was really a terrible thing. Of I mean, we targeted sure. the wrong yes. building. Yes. It's not like collateral no. damage, no. you know, no. No. just uh, a few yes. fragments. No, no, no. no. And so yeah. it was very difficult for the Chinese to believe this was an accident because yes. they're in awe of, of our, our tech, of our, not just our technology, but our organizational oh. management. Sure. Yeah, they couldn't have done it by mistake. Sorry. And I think there are many people in the United States who were also oh, imbued with this conspiratorial sure. thinking sure. and yeah. okay. think it was. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I was responsible for trying to uh, get a good, detailed explanation out of the CIA and the Pentagon, which was well, not. That would have been interesting. That was also <laughs> a easy. challenging task, yes. but we did we it. We had to have it. Well, we had to have it. It was only fair that we of go course. give them an of explanation. Of so. Of course. We did that. I worked with Under Secretary Tom Pickering, who is, you know, one of our greatest diplomats, and uh, he uh, went. He had the unenviable, unenviable job of going over and presenting the explanation and responding to questions. Oh, right. Not an easy job. No, no not an easy job. You also had some high points. You went to China, I think, with President Clinton when he did his. He did a press conference. That must have been, how did you negotiate that? That's not they, their way of doing things, I think. Is that true? No, well, what was remarkable, you always have a press conference, but this press conference went live yes. to the Chinese people. So it gave mm -hmm. President Clinton the opportunity to speak about everything, human rights, Tibet, all these sure. subjects that are sure. very sensitive in China, yeah. directly to the Chinese people to communicate our values. Right. And yes. that was, it, of course, we requested it, but we never expected to, get, to get it. get it. I see. And okay. uh, we didn't know until it happened yes. that it was really? live. Yes. I see. Did that reflect a warming of, of relations then? I mean, that they would allow that to happen? I think the Chinese Communist Party leadership at that point in time, in June of 1998, was That's feeling was quite right. confident, mm -hmm. quite secure. Mm -hmm. And it was during a period of loosening up domestically. 
mm -hmm. as well. I see. They had been showing sure. greater toleration of different mm -hmm. points mm -hmm. of view, mm -hmm. allowing people to express them. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of spring-like atmosphere right. politically right. in China at that mm -hmm. moment. So mm -hmm. I think that's what the mm -hmm. decision reflected, mm -hmm. as well as wanting to uh, contribute to a good relationship mm -hmm. with the United States. Mm -hmm. And it certainly mm -hmm. was very helpful in yeah. that respect. Had the president of China, I've lost track of time, had he already been to this country? Had he yes, already Yes, he came his? in October of 97. So that had created some goodwill, one would hope, I mean. Yes, I think Jiang Zemin had a very good trip here mm -hmm. and really appreciated the way President Clinton despite all the controversies surrounding China policy at right. the time. If right. you remember yes. Yes. Uh, campaign contribution issues, oh, right. the Cox Committee, yes. Uh, yes. speculation about Chinese espionage, there were uh, criticisms of China and of the Clinton administration's policies to try to engage China and yes. develop a decent relationship yes. with China yes. swirling around. So it took considerable uh, political courage for President Clinton to host the Chinese I, president I, I've at certainly that time. felt that way, yes. And, uh, and they must have known that. Yes, they knew that and they appreciated the personal mm -hmm. courtesy shown by the President, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Clinton, to Jiang Zemin and his wife. And, uh, you know, President had an evening private meeting with Jiang Zemin the night before the state visit. And those kinds of mm -hmm. gestures, uh, you know, he appreciated very much. Of course, he also had to listen to the president speak very frankly about human, human rights, rights and example. things like that. Yes. But yeah. uh, I think he, he became personally invested mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a good relationship mm -hmm. with the United mm -hmm. States. And when you have such a highly centralized authoritarian of course, of regime, course. having the personal commitment of the leader of course. is very important. Of course. And that may have contributed then to the warmth at Clinton's visit back in 98. That's may right. Have, may have done. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Uh, does, that, does that feeling of goodwill continue, do you think? Uh, is that well, a fair question? I, it's hard I, to say you're not. You're I not. think that Jiang Zemin does himself believe that it's important for China to have a non-hostile, decent relationship with the United States. Certainly, he and other leaders appreciate how strong the United States is now, economically, yes. militarily, yes. and that it would be very much against China's own interests to have a Cold War with the United States. However, since that high point of the relationship of, in June of 98, we've had the Belgrade bombing. Yes. And also, I think Jiang Zemin doesn't feel as personally secure domestically. Oh. Oh. Because during 1999, there was great concern about domestic unrest. The Falun Gong, or, or more well, broadly than even, that? Well, this is even, Falun Gong started a little later, but, uh, well, f the fact that he has reacted oh. so... Um, vigorously. Vigorously yes. to this mm -hmm. group, spiritual group Yes, that, it's a little surprising, yeah. Mm -hmm. And many people in China consider yeah. this an overreaction. Uh-huh, yes. But I think it indicates this sense of insecurity, which right. is also focused sure. on democracy activists, sure underground, unregistered mm -hmm. churches, mm -hmm. house churches, right. and pretty much any organized group that could possibly pose a political threat mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the regime. Right. So his, his, and therefore the regime's response to the United States might be cooler if he tries to solidify his own standing, I mean, or something. Well, what Maybe he does, I think, is to uh, stoke nationalism yes of course in China sure. as a sure. way of, of course uh, building people's commitment to sure. the regime sure. to him sure. to the party, the party. Sure. and to show that mm -hmm. they are all staunch nationalists sure. and sure. this leads to some really sharp-edged domestic rhetoric mm -hmm. about the United sure. States as well sure. as Taiwan and sure. Japan ah, mm -hmm. and that kind of rhetoric mm -hmm 
solves a short-term political course. problem yes. for him domestically, right. Right. but in the long run, it can be very damaging. Of course, because those memories li linger even, I mean, of course they do. Right. So yeah. I am very concerned about this, actually, right. Right. that public opinion is becoming more mm -hmm. negative toward mm -hmm. the United States oh, that's and unfortunate. China. Yeah, that is. Now that you're back, uh, does, can you reflect on how this really quite marvelous experience is going to affect your scholarship, your teaching? I mean, is this, you've been right at the center of things for three well, years. Well, I'm teaching a new course on U.S.-China relations mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. IRPS, RPS, mm -hmm. the Graduate School of right. International Relations right. Pacific Studies, and that's enabled me to step back, look at the big picture, sure. right. uh, which is good. Mm -hmm. Get a little more perspective sure. instead of being so close sure. up. Yeah. And I'm also, you know, I've been in Washington very aware of the impact of our domestic politics on China policy. But my previous research has been about Chinese politics. So now what really interests me and that I'm hoping to do a big project on is how the nature of Chinese domestic politics shapes its foreign policy. A little bit what we were just talking about. Exactly. In a sense. That's how the how the leadership has to respond and how it tries to direct its internal policies relative to, as it... Use foreign policy use, for its exactly. own domestic political ends. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that'll be fascinating. That's, that's, that's the next agenda that's right. for you? That's what I'm working on right now. So, so who are your students in this class? These are the... Well, the, uh, the Graduate School of International Relations Pacific Studies uh, is primarily a master's program. Yes for students who want to not just go into foreign policy, but also business sure. and finance and Internet, international, international organizations. Yes. And you know, IRPS is just focused on Asia and Latin America, in yes. contrast to the schools back east that concentrate on Europe. Europe. So, uh, and we have a lot of students from Asia. I mean, one of the most interesting things for me now is to teach about China to these incredibly impressive Chinese students. Oh, that's interesting. That would be a So great, it's yeah. a, uh, the student yes. body, you know, the Chinese and other Asian and Latin American kids learn a lot from the American students and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's really, mm -hmm. the school has changed in the three years because there are more students from Asia and I think mm -hmm. that's made it, for me, yeah. you know, the teaching challenge sure. is even more sure. enjoyable. That's a great plus for us then and for our school to have you had that experience. A quick question, if you were, if someone else, one, another colleague was invited back to Washington to play a role like yours, what would you advise them to do? I definitely would advise them to accept. Take because the, take, take the plunge, it's... Sure. It's a big commitment. It's terrific to have a chance. Well, I'm a big advocate of having at least two careers in your life anyway, because you use different abilities sure. that you may not sure. even be aware of that course. you have and uh, that's really a terrific right. feeling. And then you get to bring what you know back there and then you get to know what you're there back here. Sounds like a very nice combination. I'd like to thank my guest today, Professor Susan Shirk, for a very engaging conversation and for all of the wonderful ideas she's brought back uh, from Washington with her. Susan, thank you for being here. Thank you, Pat. Mary, back to you. Thank you, Pat. Next on Conversations, the Teeny Tiny Pit Orchestra provides live music and sound effects for screenings of classic silent films. At the Music, Film, and Video Library here at UCSD, we have a performance group called the Teeny Tiny Pit Orchestra for Silent Films, a long name for a small group. It's basically an outreach program to get new people into the library. We started out very small, three people. We use one true musical instrument to provide some sort of a narrative. And then the other two people would do sound effects, slapstick sound effects. And we've gradually gotten bigger. And, and for some events, we, we get down. I've done events alone. Uh, and for some events, there can be up to nine people in the pit.
because the films come from a particular era, and because I work in a music library with a lot of excellent resources, it's not a problem finding some sort of a, a fake book or a folio of songs from the era. You know, greatest hits from 1900 to 1919, that kind of a uh, opportunity. And we just pull the book, look through the songs, and because we're very much in love with any cliches that we can possibly use, it's obvious if someone comes home, we're gonna play Home Sweet Home. If someone gets in their car, we're gonna play Come Away With Me, Lucille, in my merry Oldsmobile. We try to pick appropriate songs from the appropriate era and the appropriate country of the, keeping the filmmaker in mind. For this next movie, we've blown it. We're, we're, uh, the, the song we're using is just too beautiful to pass up, even though it's about 30 or 40 years uh, in the wrong direction. And sometimes we make some artistic decisions, like there's one movie that we love doing, uh, Une Dame Vraiment Bien, and we can't resist using an inappropriate song for that, La Vie en Rose. But we always tell the audience if, if we've cheated. <laughs> the criteria for the films that we use are fairly simple. We prefer the short films because we're terrible at the long films. And for the short films, we can just get away with picking a couple songs, and that takes care of the, the underlying narrative music. You know, our goal is to call attention to the wonderful collection that we have. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm only concerned with entertainment value. And I'll leave uh, any kind of um, scholarly, you know, overviews to a scholar who wants to get involved with it. Early film from the even from the, the move from the Nickelodeon, that is the individual viewing, um, to the, the group viewing, um, always had sound. I mean, in a sense, there never was silent film. There's somehow there's something in human nature that, that always wants to, you know, to push art to be as close to the, you know, the natural world as possible. And so film is no different. And so right off the bat, they wanted to move towards something that was more real. Well, the way to make it more real was to add sound, which was the, you know, the missing element. First I watch the 16 millimeter film to make sure that it's in good shape. Right now we're sticking with just 16 millimeter because there's a certain amount of snob appeal of, of using 16 millimeter and a certain amount of romance with it being celluloid that's being put into a projector that people still appreciate. And if it's in good shape, then we have a video dub made, and then I watch it in slow motion, and I just write down the uh, actions that I see and the title card sayings. I'm, I'm not making a shot-by-shot -shot analysis, but it's, it's as if I was making a shot-by-shot -shot analysis. Man falls down, one in 23 seconds, woman slaps man. And as we look through all of that information, we just look at our shelves of noisemakers and decide what cliches we're in love with. And I have a master sheet saying what these sound effects are and, and, if it, if, and how, you know, woman's 23 seconds, woman's 25 seconds, woman's 26. We don't provide the sounds of reality, actually. We do try to pick out the, the significant sounds from every scene and, and provide sounds sound effects for that. And this way, whoever happens to be available for our little Foley band, our little sound effects band, they get to pick, just before we show the movie, what sounds they want to do. And so, at the beginning of every performance, the, all the Foley people get together and we split up the sounds. We say, I want this, I want this. And then, at, when we begin the song, we take all the Foley instruments we're going to need for that and put them together and we try to hit them all. Sometimes we miss a few and sometimes we ad-lib like I did on the kazoo and the uh, pomp and circumstance. It was definitely not written there, but I thought it might be fun. In a way, the whole show is improv. Yes, we're working with some kind of a score. Only occasionally is it a formal score that we've done, that we've done through you know, some sort of a program where you can you know, print out a score based upon instruments, finale. But most of the time we're just working from 
some sort of a fake book, which is a, a term borrowed from popular and jazz musicians where it's just uh, a sheet showing the song and the melody line and some chord symbols. Often it's that. I do set up the music so that it's more of a sing-along, really. There is at least one person in the band who really is feeling responsible. Probably Gail it's going to be, probably Gail Gibson. As the keyboard player, I tune the other instruments. And um, some of the pieces, I'll play the introductory part. I'll play a little riff while people are changing music or turning pages, or just in between uh, films. I'll play some little ditty on the piano just to keep the flow going. And she has to keep playing no matter what. And if someone's music falls down or someone's oboe reed dries up, that's okay because Gail is still playing and they can just come in on the second verse. It's no pressure. And the pieces are pretty uh, straightforward and, and pretty simple. And you just do a little improvisation from that piece. And then Scott will holler out, okay, we're going to take it from page two or this, and then you just flow right into it. You can get interested in the film because they're really funny. And uh, sometimes you might forget when you're supposed to come in. But you just catch up. We often do invite um, and encourage audience participation. Sometimes we can hand out some instruments. Very often we hand out things for the audience to use and that just adds a new dimension to the, the viewing of the film. The audience does have a huge role in these presentations. It can be distracting, I guess, but uh, you know, that is a challenge that we love. And we really want the audience to perform with us. Perhaps that's our biggest goal, and I think the musicians understand that, and the, and the sound effects kids as well understand that. Uh, and they really, everyone ends up enjoying it. Uh, there is some gunfire in this movie, and uh, we here at the Teeny Tiny Pit Orchestra for Silent Films do not believe in guns, but we do believe in bubble wrap. So we're passing out bubble wrap to everybody to help us with the ammunition fire when that happens. So there's bubble wrap coming around, big bubble wrap, small bubble wrap. Everyone take a big piece. And when you see gunfire, you know what to do. And if you don't, we'll just yell out, bubble wrap. It hasn't yet become a problem. I mean, obviously the kids continue popping the bubble wrap when there aren't any guns firing. But that doesn't seem to distract from it. It just kind of adds to the atmosphere. It's never a problem because it's all in fun and there are no fanatics, nobody just, you know, I'm going to be the solo bubble buster or whatever. It's just um, participation and a mutual give and take. I mean, like cinema in the early days was, it was really sort of participatory. I mean, you, people would go and, and uh, you know, the music would be live and the sound effects would be, would be certainly be live. And, you know, people would be talking amongst themselves and, you know, talking to the, to the screen and to the, you know, sometimes there was a narrator. So it really was sort of this interactive kind of thing. And sometimes the movie really was, at least the moving image of, really was the, the least of the, of the entertainment of, of that evening. What did I call this one again, do you remember? Uh, vibra Slap. Thank you. Flexitone. You can actually find, this is an, a, a legitimate orchestral percussion instrument used, you know, uh, there are some Mazorsky symphonies that have it as a, an effect, which is wavy lines showing it. Of course, in the course of the event, we're showing off a lot of musical instruments. And that is what I enjoy doing the most, being a musician. Having a nice hands-on opportunity that the audience has a nice hands-on opportunity. I let them play on everything. I think because of the way the music programs are so scarce in the school systems now, this gives children an opportunity to interact with musical instruments and, and people in the music profession, um, whereas maybe they might not have it in their schools. Apparently, people end up learning a lot about film history just by coming to these events too. Uh, 
apparently some of them have never seen a silent film. And maybe they've never seen uh, a silent film projected. It's the actual source. It's the thing. I mean, and it's, there's something that's nice about showing a, um, you know, a Keaton short or, or earlier and actually have, you know, the thing itself. I mean, it's the, it's the print of it. Um, and there's something that's sort of magical about that, about the clackety of the projector and the light that's filtering through the, through the plastic and the chemical and how that the, it flickers on the screen. I mean, it's a very wonderful experience. It's what the cinema experience is. And we've all learned a lot, uh, and the audience gets to learn a lot. Um, but that all happens secretly. We're just concentrating on the entertainment value. Finally tonight, newly selected astronaut candidate Megan MacArthur, a researcher from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography with UCSD TV's Rich Wargo. Megan, thank you very much for joining us. Would you give us a little insight uh, into your background, your childhood? Um... Sure. Um, I come from a Navy family. My father was a career naval officer. He was a naval aviator, so we moved all over the world uh, growing up. I have two older sisters and a, and a baby brother. Um, so that was a, a unique experience and a unique way to grow up. Do any of your uh, siblings share your uh, technical or scientific interests or exploits? Well, they both, um, uh, they both work in technical and, and medical fields. Uh, my younger brother's still in high school, so he's not quite sure what he's going to do yet. But uh, my sister Erin um, studied biology in school and, and now works in the medical field. My sister Shannon works for a company that exports electronics to Japan, but uh, they work more in sales and marketing side of things. How did you come to pursuing science or the technical fields? Were you always interested as a, as a child? Did you have any particular inspiration, teachers, or? No, I think that um, as a young girl, I was always fascinated by airplanes. My, like I said, my father was a pilot. So as a very young girl, I used to think that's what I wanted to do when I grew up, was be a pilot like my daddy. Um, and I think that in high school, I certainly enjoyed maths and sciences, but I didn't have a particular uh, field of interest until I decided to go to college and study aerospace engineering. Um, I knew that I was interested in the space program. Whether or not that meant being an, becoming an astronaut, I wasn't sure, but um, I, I certainly was very interested always in, in space, space, space exploration. Was it at this time when you had this fascination with flight or, or that you thought about being an astronaut? Is it the same kind of child, childish wonder, you know, boy, I'd like to go into space? That I think certainly that's where it started. My family maintains that it's something I talked about as a very young girl. Uh, and certainly, I think, like you said, all children dream about, well, wouldn't that be cool to be an astronaut? Um, I know that I started thinking about it as a, as a real dream in high school and saying that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and that's, I think, why I, one of the reasons I, I went towards aerospace engineering. But I think at that time, I, I really thought, well, this is not something that, that just anybody can do. And, and I just wanted to be connected with it no matter what. And I think it probably wasn't until I neared the end of my undergraduate work that I started to think about it as, you know, I could maybe really do this and started to look into to how to go about doing it. You're doing research here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the Marine Physical Laboratory, um, which seems to be a far stretch from going into space. What is your research? What do you do here at, at Scripps? I study uh, shallow water acoustics. I study how sound propagates underwater and what we can use, what we can learn about the ocean environment from that. Um, I don't think that it's that big of a stretch, quite honestly, from oceanography to aerospace. They're both environments that are hostile to people, that it's not easy to survive and explore them. And I think that those, the, the challenges that are inherent in, in both fields appealed, appealed to me. When you seriously consider the possibility that you, gee, maybe I could be an astronaut, did you do anything in particular, special to plan, a uh, course of study, um, uh, well, focus? It, it, uh, it seemed to me that the majority of civilian astronauts had PhDs in, sci in the sciences, and so I started to, I'd thought about that 
anyway going on to get a master's degree in engineering so I started to seriously think about PhD programs and at that time I started to talk to people about what that was like what was it, what it was like to go on to get a doctorate I had the opportunity to meet Kathy Sullivan and one of the things that she told me that stuck with me was that if you're going to go on to do doctorate research you need to choose something that you love doing no matter what happens in your life you need to choose a path that you know if you're not going to get into the space program you're still going to enjoy doing this research because the odds of getting into the space program are pretty slim so I started to think about my options and at the time I had become involved in uh, an engineering project called the human powered submarine races I would built a submarine with some fellow engineers and really fell in love with ocean engineering uh, and the and the uh, just the cutting edge technology that was being explored in that field and so I started to look at the different ocean engineering and oceanography programs and discovered the program here, the Applied Ocean Sciences program here, and really liked what they were doing here and started to look into the different fields of study that were available here. Do you think that your line of training, your, your specialized education, um, helped your being chosen as an astronaut? Well, I certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't claim to, to know what goes on in the mind of the selection board but I do think that there are parallels, as I said, between oceanography and between aerospace exploration, simply because it is so difficult to conduct research at sea. So there are, there are probably parallels between, between the two that may have helped. I think, in general, that having some kind of operational experience, meaning working with hardware, deploying instruments, uh, scuba diving certainly, um, is, I know, is part of the training uh, for astronauts, so I think that there probably are a few things in there that were that were appealing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Very few people on the planet are ever going to go through this process. Can you give us a, a sense of what takes in the application and the selection process? Sure. NASA basically accepts applications on a continuing basis and every two years, at least this is the way the program is structured now, every two years they set a deadline so in July of last year, July 1999, there was a deadline for submitting your applications for consideration for this, this year's class. They review those applications, they get a couple thousand of them, and they review those applications and then ask a few hundred people, maybe 300 people, to get flight physicals. And I think that's just to verify your basic um, physical fitness uh, in terms of eyesight, that kind of thing. Then they invite about 120 people out to Houston for a week of interviews. Uh, 20 people at a time. So in September, I was invited out for, for that week. There were there were 20 of us, and it's largely medical exams. You go through a week of, of fairly rigorous physical physical tests, and uh, some psychological and psychiatric tests and, and interviews, and then an interview with the selection board. And um, they interviewed people from September through February this year, and they also um, do a federal background investigation on you. And so I found out in March that I was having a background investigation conducted on me, and then um, then it was waiting to hear what their selection would be. So that interview with the selection board must have been one of the final or the final interviews. Are you allowed to tell us anything about it? what was it like? Were sure. there other astronauts on the board? Mm -hmm. Was it it's doctors and probably a range of people? Probably two thirds astronauts, I would say, and then other directors of the various programs at the space center. Um, it was, it was really fun, actually. Um, there were probably a dozen people there. There might be 18 or 20 people on the board, but only a dozen of them were there for me. And um, basically, you talk about yourself. It's not a technical interview in that sense. They, they just want to know about your experiences, what you've done. They'll interrupt you and ask you to, to tell more about a certain story. Um, so really, I mean, you're the expert on yourself. And so in that sense, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was really neat just to be in a room with a lot of those people. In that final discussion, that interview, did you ever get any any idea that you may have been selected or that you were? No, not really. Um, certainly, I left the room thinking, "Oh, that was that was fun. I did a good job. You know, I, I gave a, presented a good case and, and told them all about myself." And then five minutes later, you're thinking, "Oh gosh, I could have I could have said this instead. And <laughs> why didn't I answer this way? That would have been so much better." So, really, I mean, a, a lot of people they sort of keep their cards close to their chest. They don't. Um, they didn't really give you a sense one way or the other, which, which makes sense. I wouldn't expect them to. And honestly, the people that I interviewed with, I mean, these people, they're tremendous. They've done so many things. They're so, so much experience, um, so well-educated from such a diverse background. Um, 
that really it, it's hard to it's hard to look at these other people and say, oh sure, they're gonna they're gonna pick me up over all these people. So not really a sense that it was gonna be me. That that is really amazing in my experience working with people in administration of NASA and people in the field in NASA, the different space centers, it, the degree of professionalism and the level of education and dedication is is truly unparalleled. It's interesting that the field gets narrowed down rather quickly from 2,000 to hundreds to a fraction of hundreds and then to a few tens of people. If you don't make it through the final interview or you aren't selected at that point, are you allowed to go back and, sure. and apply again? Sure. Another I round? believe they ask everyone to update their applications on a yearly basis and they keep all of the applications in a pool and they are considered um, every time they go through the selection process. So you had your final interview, the fun interview in, in the fall, and recently you were notified. How were you notified and what was the first thought? Well, I was mind? notified by telephone. I was phoned by a fellow called Bill Parsons, who is the Center Operations Director at Johnson Space Center. And um, I just started laughing. That was, that was my only reaction. I just started laughing. And I shut my office door and I said, well, I, I need to sit down. And he said, well, let me give you a, a second to collect yourself. And, uh, and I just, I, I, honestly, I just laughed. I was surprised, thrilled, didn't know what to say. Just a giddy, happy. Absolutely. You <laughs> guys laugh, that must be amazing. You had just been selected to what is undoubtedly one of the, the most elite group of human beings on the planet, people who are going possibly to venture into space. You're gonna be facing some incredible tasks, some, some very demanding work and we put in some very dangerous situations, albeit controlled, but there's the element of danger. When did those, did you have any of those thoughts? What, what was going through your mind after you collected yourself, after you <laughs> sat down and stopped laughing for a bit? I think, honestly, on some level, I think it hasn't really hit me yet. Certainly, I think about the things that you've mentioned, and I have thought about them for years, that this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, I really look forward to the challenges that will be involved in training and then hopefully when I get a chance someday to, to train for space flight and then actually go. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that it's just so, it's hard to get your head around it really. Um, I think my, my thoughts still are just so thrilled that to have the opportunity, um, really looking forward to, to meeting the challenges. What do you personally want to do as an astronaut? Well, I, I really hope I have the opportunity to go to the space station. I live on the space station for a while. Um, also have the opportunity to conduct an EVA, extravehicular activity. Um, that, would be, that would be tremendous. Um, I, I also, one of the things that I've enjoyed doing here as a graduate student and prior to that as an undergraduate student is outreach work to the community, promoting science education for children and for secondary schoolers. I think that's very important and I, and I hope that, that in this role I'll have that opportunity maybe to open up some doors for some young people. In terms of becoming an astronaut, um, what do you do now? What are the next few steps? Where are you going in the next couple of weeks? Well, in about two weeks I leave for Pensacola, Florida and I'm going to be going through water survival training in preparation for some military flight training that will take place later on. Um, then we'll be oriented in, at Houston at the Johnson Space Center. We will travel around a little bit to some of the various NASA installations. We'll go through some land survival training and then I'll begin military flight training in Pensacola I think towards the end of September and after that I'm not sure. Is it true that um, you will learn to fly a jet? Well, the flight training that I'll be doing in Pensacola will be in the T-34s, which is the Navy prop trainer, same plane that my dad learned to fly, so that'll be really neat. Um, my understanding is that the mission specialist astronauts and astronaut candidates fly backseat in the T-38, which is a single in an engine jet trainer. I don't believe we'll be trained to actually pilot it, though. Have you ever piloted an airplane? Are you looking forward? I have a private pilot's license um, that I have been working on. I got in February and been flying for about a year now and it's awesome, I love it, it's, it's a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to, to doing some more intensive training. Did you get your private license um, after starting the application process for me an astronaut, one of those things you were doing? Or? Um, it's something that I've always wanted to have the opportunity to do, and I started doing it 
about a, year, a little over a year ago, so before I put the application in, but I, um, I think that probably having some experience, some exposure to flight training is a good idea. Besides doing the, your job perfectly, doing everything right, conducting inter interesting research, what, is there anything you dream about or think about or, or want to experience the most by being in space, going into space? Well, I suppose there's the very obvious answer of, I can't wait to look back and see the Earth from out there. I think there has to be few experiences that could, that could equal that. In high school, in your secondary education, you started to think, gee, I'd like to be an astronaut, maybe I could do that. If a 15-year-old told, told you that she or he wanted to become an astronaut and wanted to start planning to do that, what advice or counsel would you, would you give to someone in, in secondary in schools? I think that's about the age that I started to think about it. I think one of the most important things that I've learned since then is that it's hard to make any one plan and stick with it. There are a lot of different ways to get here. People take a lot of different paths. And I think the most important thing is to not be afraid to go down some of the different roads that are going to open up to you. Um, you need to find something that you love doing and be the best that you possibly can be at it. Um, so there isn't one particular major that you need to think about going into in college. Certainly um, you need to be a scientist or you need to have the operational background of being in the military, at least at this point. So I think if the child has, if the teenager had an interest in science, then it would be finding what field of science really appeals to you and, and being the best that you can be at that. And also just live your life. Um, experience as many different things as you can because it's not just the ability that you have on paper in terms of your education, but, but the experiences that you've had in life and how you get along with other people and um, what you can contribute to a group situation. If a five-year-old were to ask you the same question, what would you say? Well, I would tell a five-year-old, I think a way to determine if you have an interest in science is to ask a lot of questions. Their parents probably wouldn't like that. but. <laughs> ask a lot of questions about how something works, why it works the way it does. I think that we have, we have a tendency to just accept things at face value, flip a switch and the light comes on. But I think that the way to explore an interest in science is to ask, well, how does that happen? Why does it happen? And to start thinking about, about science at that level. Science is a lot of fun. It's, it can be like a game for kids an exploratory game and kids love it when you when you approach science that way in an experimental fashion and I think that would be the way to to spark an interest in science to think about why the world is the way it is when you look around you. You've been selected to take an active role and be at the very leading edge of one of the most ambitious and adventurous enterprises that humanity's ever undertaken stepping off the planet so to speak. At this point what do you hope to accomplish as an astronaut? What contribution do you, do you hope you could, you could make to that enterprise? I think my role, or, or my role would be really as, as part of the team, being the best team member that I can be to help the program as a whole achieve its goals. I think that astronauts are trained as generalists and you need to have the ability to be a lot of different things play a lot of different roles and I hope that that through this training and from my background that I'll have the ability to to contribute in that way. You bring up a very good point and we tend to forget it that space travel, space exploration isn't only just the astronauts and I mean, that's a very big and important part but there are many hundreds and thousands of people behind every hour, every Absolutely. minute, every second of work that goes on in space and that's an enterprise which takes in really a whole society and our, and our culture in a way, because we're making the decision to do that. What do you dream that the whole enterprise of human space exploration may contribute, may accomplish? That's a big question. <laughs> I think that, um, I think it's in our nature to explore. I think it's always been in our nature to explore and to push the boundaries of what we think we can know and what we think we can achieve. And I think that the space program for me symbolizes in a lot of ways that continued drive for exploration, that continued need to push the boundaries of, 
of who we are and what, and what we can know. And I think that beyond that, certainly the, the practical advances that are required, the technical advances that are required to support this kind of endeavor certainly have many, many benefits back here on Earth in medical sciences and in computer sciences and all of the areas of the exploration that are going on here on the Earth. When you get to Houston and you, and you um, meet your other classmates and your colleagues, is there anything you'd like to say then? Any, what would you first say to them? I'm just happy to be here. Hope I can help the ball club. <laughs> well, Megan, thank you very much for, for you, joining Rich. us today. I really look forward to following your career. I hope you would come back to us in a couple of years or when you're allowed to, when you're out of, when you're out of your training. Sure. Um, and we look forward to hearing your name on a manifest and hearing you go up on this shuttle and Thank you. be on the space station. Thank you very much.